Hello, everyone. Uh, Susan Damiani. I am the director of gift planning and for the McAllen Society at St. John's University. And I'm your host today of St. John's Power Hour number 23. And today we're talking about year end tax planning opportunities under COVID-19. Uh, I think it's a very important uh, subject matter uh, in light of elections, uh, societal unrest, uh, this pandemic. Uh, and I know many of you have a lot of questions. I know just uh, leading up to this uh, conversation today, uh, I encourage all of you to jump on this call. I think uh, I'm hoping even for myself to learn some things now with a different president. What does that what does that mean and and how should we plan? And I think planning is uh, critical right now more than ever uh, under these circumstances. So let me just first introduce you to our wonderful panelists here that are going to help us. Today we have John Separano, the one that is muted right now. John is a graduate, 1985, great uh, classmate of mine at St. John's University, graduated from the College of Business Administration. John is not only a financial advisor, but he's also a, a CPA, and he's the principal and wealth manager of Madeira Wealth Management, LLC. Then we also have uh, Donna Fiore. She is a graduate of uh, the St. John's graduate, 2001 the School of Law, and she has her own law office in Astoria, Queens, New York. And uh, also joining us today, um, you may not recognize, her face may not be familiar to you, uh, maybe John and Donna, because they're always panelists on our Meet the Experts. But thank you, Mindy, for, for joining us. This is John's colleague, Mindy Cleveland, and she's a senior financial advisor at uh, Modera Wealth Management as well. So I know we have so much to talk about and to cover, and I know you're going to have lots and lots of questions. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Mindy. Okay, great. Thanks, Susan. And, you know, I think the first thing that we'll talk about, um, we'll be touching on um, tax planning, tax planning as it relates to your income taxes and your state taxes. Um, but first to address the elephant in the room, um, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic in an election year, um, and a lot of people are talking about the markets and, and what we should expect in the next six months. Um, you know, and I have a lot of clients who are asking that, and, and we do want to give you an outlook. Um, but before I go there, uh, give our perspective here, you know, just want to give an overview of three of our core investment investment beliefs. Um, so these are three things that I talk about with all of my clients um, and really to keep the perspective. So first, one you've likely heard often, diversification is key. So well-rounded portfolio can be built to weather through storms like we're going through right now. Uh, one of the first things that I do with my clients is look at their investment mix and ensure they have a healthy balance of U.S. stock, international stock, U.S. bonds, international bonds, some real estate. By having exposure to these asset classes and then diving even deeper into different size companies within the stock market, um, various types of fixed income or bonds for stability, you're not only spreading out the risk and reducing reducing volatility so your eggs aren't in one basket, but it also allows you to participate in the upside of the market in certain asset classes. So we think about this year, most of the growth that we've, we've seen this year have come from a handful of large companies um, who have done well through this pandemic um, and lifted the market and, and we've seen returns there. And then the most recent uptick uh, with the good news of the vaccina vaccination trials, you know, smaller companies are doing well. So diversifying and investing in multiple asset classes allows you to enjoy, enjoy the benefit of both large and small companies in this example. Um, second, my second core belief is rebalancing should be done throughout the year. Uh, the concept of rebalancing is ensuring that you're always in the most appropriate asset mix. Uh, let's say, you know, depending on your tolerance for risk, depending on your goals, if you're in a 50-50 mix, 50% stock, 50% bonds, and that's the most efficient way to meet your goals, you need to rebalance to ensure you're always in that allocation over time. 
So let's go back to happier times, the beginning of 2019. When um, 2019, we had great returns in the market. If you were invested 50% stock or half of your portfolio in the market, and you did nothing throughout the year, the percentage of stock in your account by the end of the year would be higher. And in turn, you have a riskier portfolio. So rebalancing is selling those profits and protecting them into more stable investments like bonds. That way you're always in the right mix. And then we fast forward to March of this year when the market tanked, unfortunately, and bonds were up, we were able to, to sell out of bonds, um, rebalance into stocks and participate in the market growth over time um, throughout this year. So really this is the concepting of concept of um, buying low and selling high, little contrary to how we feel in the moment and those emotions. My third core belief, um, 90 percent of portfolio returns can be attributed to asset allocation. So I just want to share my screen real quick for this one. Sorry, bear with me here. Okay, you should see a chart here. Um, it talk it says importance of asset allocation. 94% of portfolio returns are attributed to asset allocation. Market timing, getting in, getting in and out of the market um, accounts for a very small piece of the por of your portfolio returns. And that's really because you have to know that how to get it right and, and get it right twice. When do you get out of an asset class, but then when do you buy back into it? And an average investor will likely sell when the market's low, almost to the bottom. And then by the time they get back in, they've missed out on some of that growth that could significantly impact their portfolio. So I just want to share this slide to just reinforce. There's been a lot of studies done. This is consistent over time that maintaining asset allocation and rebalancing has a greater effect on your portfolio than trying to time the market. Sorry there, what happened to my video? Um, so that's asset allocation, my three, four, three core beliefs. Um, you know, and let's turn to the market outlook. I say if we were presenting this a month ago, we'd be talking more about headline risk with the election. Every four years, we see headline risk with the election. The political back and forth creates uncertainty. And quite frankly, the market doesn't like uncertainty. Um, so, you know, ultimately, though, in election years, regardless of the outcome, we tend to see um, a positive year in the market. Um, now that we know more about what's happening with this outcome, um, I think a lot of the uh, the returns have been priced into the market and our greater concern is going to be the, the coronavirus. Um, we've seen it this week. Um, we've seen that, you know, there's there's effective vaccines out there. We hope that continues as more health solutions come into the marketplace. Um, we'll be we'll see more um, positive news and stronger growth in the market um, and forecasts for reopening the economy. So my advice to everyone listening in today, you know, check your investment allocation, make sure you're diversified. Keep an eye on um, more news to come for the virus. Again, that's going to be more impactful over time. And don't make rash decisions on your portfolio. Um, you know, don't, don't try to time the market, get in and out. Make sure you're meeting with your advisor and assessing a strategy. So with that, actually, I want to turn it over to John. You know, what are your thoughts here? Um, and can you expand more on how, did the, how does the election, how does the pandemic impact the market? Um, you were also talking about some planning opportunities for clients the other day. So maybe you could share that with the group. Sure. 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 The, re the reality is, is that Try now. Try now. Unmute me on the screen and I'll shut off the phone.
Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Great. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, right now, the reality is, is that uh, it's a very natural reaction to want to go to safety when you're unsure of what's going on. It's the old caveman fight or flight syndrome. And basically, fight would mean stay in the game, stay in stock, stay in the market, and flight would mean no, go to cash. Well, when you play that game in the investment world and, you're, and you try to run away, the reality is, as many just indicated, is that you can get in and out of the market at the wrong times, and it's usually what happens. Sometimes you guess right, and many times you guess wrong. What I'd like uh, Mindy to do is if she can put up a couple of slides that I'd like to share with you. This first slide here is just an overlay. I hear people uh, uh, telling me over many, many years, or about 15 years or longer, saying to me, John, this is like no other time in history. And the reality is, is that every time somebody says that, they are absolutely right. This is like no other time in history, but the reality is, is that in the marketplace, it comes down to long-term economics of companies and government uh, instruments such as bonds that we invest in will do well over long periods of time as they fight through the good and the bad times, meaning like wars, pandemics, changes in administration, changes in tax laws. But there are many good things when there are new inventions that come out, new vaccines that come out, uh, new programs for the government, international trade doing better when we get along with our partners. These things will raise hope for the future. And this slide, when you go back all the way to the depression, starting with, uh, uh, well, at least Hoover, when it was during the depression period, up through right now in Trump, you could see that the long-term rates of returns, although there will be dips and turns, go up, whether it's a Democrat or whether it's a Republican. The reality is, is that when Republican, uh, excuse me, when Democrats are in and there is a split between the Congress being in charge and the Senate, is that it does its best. Uh, but it's only slightly. So there really hasn't been a long-term preference for one over the other, other than a slight edge to Democrats, just as long as the Congress and the Senate have split. As a matter of fact, on the next slide, this shows how the S&P has done over the same exact time periods. And what you can see here is that when there were Democrats in, when there were Republicans in, and when there was a split. The reality is in terms of the spikes, in terms of the sharpness of the curve going up, in most cases it does best when you see that dark band there. So if we're anticipating a split between the Senate and the Congress, we may be headed for a better result over the next four years if that's the way it plays out. So we're hopeful that that's the way it does turn out in January when we get confirmation on the Senate. Uh, being split uh, with the Congress. On the next slide, I'd like to show you just two more. This one is what everybody's talking about right now. Okay, we got past the president. Now, what's the next thing that's of a concern to us that we can worry about? Well, it's this vaccine. It is real. It has hurt the world, not just this country. Uh, my heart goes out to all these families that have suffered from here. But when we're talking about investments, it does not have a long-term uh, impact. It has short-term impacts. Short-term is relative. It could be months, six months, one year, two years. Long-term investing, though, is over a 10-year or longer period of time. And in almost every case here, although this may be hard to read and see, over a uh, one one month uh, or over a one year period, you could see that over long periods of time, the average rates of returns on all these different epidemics and pandemics that have come out is that the long term effect here, other than when AIDS came out and pneumonic plague, there was a sm short downturn in the market there, along with the Zika and Ebola. But when you go out longer and, and add another year or two to these, the uh, marketplace has done extremely well. 
So these are short-term issues. We will get through this. Vaccines, uh, very happily to say, are coming out. We don't know when they're going to get distributed, but we do know that they're forthcoming. We'll help the markets once again. So these are the things, we can take down slides now, that are very important to, to us. Um, as we go forward here, I'd like Donna to, and by the way, raising cash is one of the best ways to calm your fears here. If you know that you have in the next six months to a year, whether you're still working or whether you're retired, uh, you're gonna, you possibly may have some cash needs. Set aside that six months to one year's worth of cash, whether it's $3,000 a month, less or more. Once you know you have that, you know that you could let the economics work here, let the market go through its gyrations until there's more certainty, uh, and in spite of whether it's going up or down. Yes, you may lose out on a little bit of run up, but I think your peace of mind is worth more than that. So for the next three to six months at a minimum, I'm recommending that people have enough cash there to cover their monthly expenses. Donna, have you, uh, how have your clients been reacting and what have you been telling them about what to expect with changes to the estate planning area? I know you're going to talk more about this later too, but just a quick overview, that would be helpful. And I, hello everyone, I hope everyone's healthy and doing well. Um, first of all, usually my clients are, you know, as an elder law attorney, is another aspect to the estate planning, you know, it's an added level is Medicaid planning. And by um, doing the proper planning, you can really save the assets of your family. Uh, right now, I mean, what I'm seeing is that people are very concerned. I'm having a lot of appointments come in because they have no documents in place. So the first thing I would say, get your basic documents. No matter what age you are, you want to have at least your basic documents in place. The basic documents are a will. A power of attorney, if that's you know a healthcare proxy, those are your three basic documents. So the will will allow you to do many things. So at least for a basic document, you can each do tax planning through that will. You can um, do whether you have a lot of assets and you need to do tax planning for married couples. Whether you have um, tax planning for charitable giving. Also, if you wanted to do also protect someone that may be in your family and you want to leave money to them that is disabled. So the will has a lot of, um, you know, a lot of benefits and it also helps at least establish a plan. Of course, when you want to do more complicated type of planning, you may consider trusts. There's a lot of different kinds of trusts. So like I said, I'm just going to give you a little overview. There's revocable trust. A revocable trust is a trust that you control. Um, so you're the trustee of that trust. An irrevocable trust meaning that someone else is in charge. Usually you want to have some controls in there so that you can pretty much control them a little bit. Um, just so most of the time, the irrevocable trust is a trust that we use for Medicaid planning. Uh, the power of attorney also helps us because in case something happens to somebody and they can't get to the bank and they can't handle financial situations, this allows the agent to be able to do these things for them. Uh, it's a very helpful tool to have. Uh, I find that you know, you know, it can be very helpful. Again, you have to have someone you can trust to be able to have a document like that. And the third document is the healthcare proxy. The healthcare proxy is all about the health. If you cannot make medical decisions for yourself, who is it that you would like to be making those decisions for you? Um, so those are your, your basic documents. As far as tax planning goes, I mean, we're gonna talk about that a little bit further, you know, as we go through this uh, conversation. But, you know, the tax laws could definitely be changing uh, depending on how things are going to, you know, even out in, in the government, right? So we know we have a new president. There's a good chance he's going to be lowering the threshold. Again, we'll talk about that in a little while. Uh, but there's also, you know, can the, uh, you know, the legislature, Congress and, and the Senate be a balance to that? So maybe it won't hurt so bad. So uh, again, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but I just wanted to give you at least the basics of the documents that really I highly recommend that you have in place. Uh, also, you know, very often I have a lot of clients that come in, they do not have estate planners, okay? Uh, financial planners, they have their money in CDs all over the place. They have substantial funds in many, uh, really not, helping them or their families, not things that are going to be a good investment for them and their families. 
So I think that they're not really, you know, using their money to the potential that it could be used um, and protected as well. I mean, so those are some things to consider as well. Um, so I'm going to hand it back to, um, let's see, who, who wants to talk now about um, Mindy? All right, what have you been discussing with your clients to provide them with peace of mind uh, going forward right now as well? Yeah, thanks, Donna. Um, you know, and I would just want to comment too, there's a question in the question box. So before I answer Donna's question, um, this sort of ties into what I was going to talk about as well. Um, the question in the, in the question box is due to the pandemic, I heard that one can withdraw from their 401k or IRA this year in 2020 without a penalty. Is that true? Um, yes, it is true. Uh, so when the CARES Act uh, was passed earlier this year, that stimulus bill, um, part of that act did allow, does allow um, a distribution of up to $100,000 from retirement accounts and the 10% penalty that applies for those under 59 and a half has been waived. Ordinary income tax will still apply if you do not redeposit the money into uh, your retirement account. So. Just quickly here on eligibility, um, you are eligible if you're diagnosed with uh, COVID-19 by a test um, approved by the CDC, um, if your or if your spouse or dependent has been diagnosed um, and you experience adverse financial consequences due to being quarantined, furloughed, laid off, unable to work. Um, there's a there's a list here. I can actually, as a follow up, we can send out some um, frequently asked questions that we put together here at Modera. Um, but there will be tax there. Now, the difference here is when you withdraw from your retirement account, typically it's taxed at ordinary income right away in that year that you've withdrawn. What the CARES Act says is that you can actually withdraw up to the hundred thousand, given a, you know subject to the eligibility requirements. Um, that money will be taxed at ordinary income over a three year period beginning in 2020, um, unless you make alternative elections. Um, so you can also pay it back. It could be part of a loan. Um, so if you do have this situation, um, you know, feel free to reach out to one of us, but um, we advise that you talk to your financial advisor to make sure this is the best place to withdraw the money and also connect with your accountant to make sure um, that you'd qualify and that you, you know, all of your ducks are in a row before you make any withdrawals. So coming back here to, um, to, Oh, sorry, there's a subsequent question here. Um, how long do you have to redeposit those funds? Um, it can, so I believe, I'll double check on the answer here when we come back. Um, I believe normal loan um, rules apply, but repayment of the loan um, may be delayed up to one year. So you can wait to begin repayments up to one year after the loan has been taken from the um, retirement account. Okay, and so now if, if it is a loan, by the way, um, and you're paying it back, um, there's no, you, you don't have to pay the ordinary income tax. So again, connect with your accountant. Um, we're not providing tax advice here on this call, but more so guidance. Um, but you, again, you want to double check with them to make sure you, all your ducks are in a row. So speaking of taxes, um, I'm going to go into that now. Um, but to answer Donna's question on how, you know, how do I keep clients um, you know, comfortable and, and not so nervous, feel some peace with all the media headlines. I don't know if there's a good answer for that because <laughs> this is always happening. You know, headlines are, um, are a risk. You see an article, it wants to draw your attention. You click into it. It's either what the topic described or it's not. Um, so really what I've been talking with my clients about is the risk is always going to be there. You know, I talked a lot about diversification, reality, uh, rebalancing earlier, um, that still applies. It's very important. And, um, you know, we look for opportunities. So headlines might create volatility and uncertainty. Again, market does not like uncertainty, um, but there's opportunities within that. So um, harvesting losses, so let's switch gears to taxes. Um, you can take losses, especially this year, as the markets fluctuated, you can sell a position that's down buy something that is similar but different enough so that you can stay in the market, but you've captured a loss. 
So let's say it's a $5,000 loss that you've captured. You can now offset future gains, whether that's a gain because you sold um, a position and realized a capital gain that way, or there's a mutual fund you hold that disperses a capital gain distribution. So those losses can offset the gains so that you can avoid to paying um, capital gain taxes in, in those cases. Um, so that's one one way we can plan. Um, that's actually, you know, a foundational tax planning opportunity. That's something that we're looking at every year, all year as looking for tax loss harvesting opportunities. Um, other things to think about, you know, this year you might um, be in a situation where your income is lower due to, um, you know, either being furloughed or job change or job loss or maybe even a, um, taking a pay cut. Um, I know that some of my clients have done that. In 2020, your required minimum distribution has been waived. So if you are subject to that, if you're over the age of 70 or 72, depending on the year you were born, you don't have to take a minimum required a required minimum distribution. Um, but now we're looking at here at the end of the year, rethinking that. Does it make sense to take your required minimum distribution? Does it make sense to realize that income through that way or even a Roth conversion? So taking some of your pre-tax money, converting it to um, pay the taxes this year and converting it to a Roth where it will grow tax-free or even recognizing long-term capital gains. Maybe there's a position that you've been invested in for quite some time. Um, you're in a lower bracket this year. You haven't wanted to sell that position because it'll realize capital gains. Maybe this year is the year you do that. Um, you know, if you are going to increase your tax bracket slightly, maybe you put yourself back where you were before the, the decrease in income. So on the other side of that, I've also had some clients who have not seen a reduction in income, um, or maybe they work in an industry that's, um, you know, you're benefiting. Maybe you're in the healthcare industry, pharmaceutical industry, your income's gone up. Um, maximizing your 401k contributions, uh, that's that's key. That's a big one. Um, you always want to do that every year. If you're over the age of 50, you also have a catch up. Um, you know, maximizing your itemized deductions is a little bit more difficult now that with the tax law changes that that came through the last few years. Um, but if there's ways to do that, you can. I'll just mention charitable giving here for a moment. In that CARES Act that I just talked about with the question that was asked, there was also a change where you can donate up to $300 of cash and receive what's considered an above the line tax deduction, meaning it's an, um, a direct reduction in income of $300. Um, and that's not subject to you know, itemized taxes, which is, is typical in normal years. Um, but the way that you might be able to maximize your itemized deduction is by donating appreciated securities. So if you have a, a position um, that has a large embedded gain, again, you don't want to sell it. You still want to donate and give this year, um, and you want to look at reducing your income. Maybe you give an appreciated security uh, to take that tax deduction this year. Uh, we do that in years where you're in a high income year. Uh, that's going, you know, maybe you bunch five years of donations. I'm going to talk about more about charitable giving a little later, so I'm not going to go too far into that. Um, but trying to you know, maximize those itemized deductions, taking the $300 above the line deduction is one way, uh, maximizing your 401ks. And with that, um, John, let me pass it back to you because you really have the background in taxes. You're um, a CPA as well, and I'm mentioning foundational opportunities, but I know that there's probably many people on this call that are concerned um, with you know, what might happen um, if Biden proposes a tax law change um, could you tell us a little bit about what we can expect there and how we might be impacted? Be impacted. Yes, thank you. Uh, th those are great things to talk about because sometimes, even though they may be just foundation of the things that we get caught up in our life and everything else, and we don't get around to doing these things by year end, then you show up at your CPA. He goes, "Here's what your taxes," and oh, I wish there was some way we could have lowered that. And they go, "Well, you could have done this." So planning ahead of time, work with your CPA, working with your uh, advisor, such as you know, Mindy or I, for example, we work on these things throughout the whole year. And as a matter of fact, we're helping the CPA stay on top of this stuff so they can work and do things with us during the year, such as projections. One of the other things, uh, just an extension on what Mindy was doing, I do this quite often, is 
in this very rare year where they suspended required minimum distributions for those people who are required to, it is a great opportunity to consider Roth conversions, which will reduce your future liability and also benefit your family and who actually actually receives these types of accounts because once money goes into a Roth account, it never gets taxed again. And many people will be in a much lower tax bracket this year retirees especially because they didn't take their required minimum distribution and be able to fill up that same tax bucket or tax bracket with these Roth conversions, especially if they don't need the cash. So this is something you really should be looking into and there is still time to do this before the end of the year. In terms of what's gonna be forthcoming, well, that's pretty interesting. I've read about three or four different, probably many more locations on things like, you know, details about President Biden's new tax laws. And these are all over. You can just Google this and you'll see this all over the place. But the reality is, is that at the moment, this is a wish list. Okay. Until legislation actually comes through, some of these things that are being proposed may or may not happen or may, or may come in some variation of this. So I want to go over a couple of things that are proposed and how they may affect you depending on what your uh, source of income uh, is. Uh, and keep in mind, if the Senate uh, stays Republican and the Congress re uh, remains Democratic, as we understand it will be, that would be very helpful for a moderate answer to all these changes. And what I mean by that, there'll be better checks and balances there. Instead of being extremely liberal with the tax laws and trying to tax more of uh, the rich to give to people that are not doing as well, or if they get really conservative and it just stays at the progressive situation that it is right now, but a little bit more moderate. If they can come together, they're going to come up with probably uh, a really solid foundational tax situation that will not hurt any one party dramatically. Okay, so let's go over some some of these things here. Uh, uh, Biden has proposed that individuals that are making more than $400,000 a year will have an increased top, uh, top tax rate that gets close to 40% once again. This is reverting back to years back where it's supposed to go back into effect, quite frankly, in 2026. So these things uh, may be coming regardless of anything. And uh, they also are saying that people that are making under $400,000 will actually either get a a decrease or they will not get an increase in many cases. But there will be some losses, some itemized deductions for the people that are over 400,000. So it's not so much just in the tax rate, it's, it's in the way of taking away deductions that people make over 400,000. Uh, he has proposed that under $400,000 that most people will be better off. That is yet to see when we see the actual uh, legislation that comes out and ultimately gets adjusted or changed. Then people are concerned about capital gain rates. People do have money in the stock market, whether it's small or large. Well, for those people that are not over 400, but over $1 million, that's where they will have a ordinary rate at whatever bracket you're in. So if you're in the 32% bracket, if that's what it winds up being, or the 35, or the 39, whatever it turns out to be, that's what your capital gains could look like if this proposed legislation goes through. The other one, uh, people that are under $1 million will not get hit with that capital gain because they are still trying to foster investment into public companies, which helps the economy. So uh, they're trying to find some kind of balance there. The other thing uh, that uh, Donna will be talking about uh, shortly here when I introduce this is talking about what's going to happen with the estate taxes and the sunsetting of the estate taxes. Unique circumstances happen every year, and these changes uh, we're waiting to see. Right now, it's a more about currently estate tax planning, uh, excuse me, estate planning opposed to estate tax planning. The exemption for an individual is over $5 million. I think it's close to, what is it, $5.6, $5.7 million, or $5.8 right now with the, this year. Uh, in a married couple, it's over $11 million jointly. 
So if they revert back and go back to uh, pre -cha pre law changes about four or five years ago, uh, these numbers will go back down to the five million dollar range. But there are some proposals to wipe this out totally. And what's more scary is that upon your death, they're proposing uh, no step up in basis, which means that your heirs will inherit these assets at these huge capital gains, and then your heirs will have to pay these taxes. So Donna, can you help us out on uh, a little bit more in depth than the intro that I just gave you with regard to estate tax law changes? What, what's being considered is Biden has been proposing dropping the amount that the federal is allowing for each individual to have as you know their maximum amount that they can give during their lifetime and as they pass. So right now, uh, it's pretty high. It's $11,580,000 per person, okay, that you can have this amount of money. So that's over $22 million between a married couple so that you can pass down to your heirs without having uh, any estate taxes. All right. Now, New York State, though, on the other hand, is five million eight hundred and fifty thousand per person. So when you have a gap like that in between, you, you know, you're exposing the estate to some taxes, possibly. I mean, obviously, these are very high numbers. But if you're in these kind of categories, even if you go in New York State, at least if you go over this five million eight hundred and fifty thousand dollar cap, only by 5%, they tax the whole thing, all right? So when we have a married couple, we wanna make sure that we're um, you know, letting some of the assets probably pass maybe through the estate when the first person passes, and then the rest go through the estate when the other person passes. You gotta plan it a little bit so that we can optimize our tax benefits because we don't want the kids to have to pay taxes. Another thing that, again, is being proposed through the Biden administration is the elimination of the step up in the tax basis. What does this really mean? All right, let's just, uh, to give you an example, say I bought a house and I only paid $20,000 for that house. Now that house is worth a million dollars. Now, if I give this to my children, usually right now we get a, t a step up in the tax basis. What does that mean? That means that when you pass, the children inherit that asset at the date of death value, the million dollars. If they eliminate this step up in the tax basis, then that means that uh, they're going to get the tax basis that you have, $20,000. That means if they try to sell that asset later on, they're going to be paying capital gains taxes on that asset. And capital gains taxes are usually at a higher tax level than um, uh, regular rate income taxes. So again, it will depend on what kind of bracket that they're in. Again, this doesn't just apply to, most of the time it applies to houses, real estate, and stocks. That's where I see it mostly being something, again, John can probably give you some more clarity on that. So, I mean, of course, then, of course, the income tax basis might be changing as well. There might be higher income taxes going forward. So I guess we're gonna learn about that. And I, I just to go back to something that, um, Mindy said, and I'm not sure if this is exactly what the question was, but I thought that when someone does take one of these, um, takes money from their, uh, under the CARES Act, if you take the money from your, uh, you know, your IRA or 401k, you have three years to return it, okay, just in case anybody, you know, and it, first you got to qualify, you got to make sure that you qualify for those, but you have three years to return it and not have to pay any of the income taxes on it, just, just to give you some clarity there. Um, so, I mean, you know, things are changing. Uh, this happens every time someone comes in to into into office. The act that right now is in place, the Jobs Act that was pre you know passed under President Trump, will expire in 2025. So we have some time. You know, you can do some planning uh, to optimize your tax planning. You know, that's always something you should be thinking about. You know, nobody wants. That's the best part of my job. I, I help people not have to pay state taxes and I get them help, uh, you know, for in case they have to go on Medicaid. So I encourage everyone to really review your plans and get your assets and your affairs in order. And I'm going to pass this back to, I guess, who, whose turn is it this time? I'm so horrible at this. Uh, John, Mindy, I'll take I, it back. I, I think it's yours. <laughs> Actually, John, let's kick it back to you. Um, so in terms of um, estate planning, if you could continue that conversation. Uh, thanks, Mindy. We're trying to work through this whole WebEx thing. It's, it's not always as easy with the passing of the baton. 
But anyway, uh, as it relates to planning ahead, you know, we're trying to get our families together. You know, Donna and I have talked about this, uh, worked on some client discussions, and uh, Mindy and I have done it internally in our firm. And, you know, this pandemic uh, just tells us how fragile life can be. And luckily, you know, uh, I'm an old fashioned guy and I believe in sharing things with my kids. They don't need to know every single detail, but they do need to know what's going on. The worst thing you can do in your family, regardless of whether you have one child, three children, no children, your sister, your brother is going to help you out, a friend, whoever it is, letting them know what their responsibilities will be or, or, or need to be. Some people may not want this responsibility. So you want to kind of know that ahead of time. What my family does is we meet uh, once a year. I get the old face, dad, oh, come on, how much, you know, do we really have to sit down and go over the stuff? And my sons are not young kids anymore, but we've been doing this since they uh, got in college. And uh, it's been about 10 years now that we've been doing this and we kind of go updates to what mom and dad's situation is, how we've got them to get wills, how we've got, got them to do powers of attorney, health care surrogates for them. And these things are very interesting. And what was really funny was um, the kids determined who their beneficiaries were and they were each going their brothers, you know, to each other because they have three boys and they were going back and forth. Well, you know, if you're really nice to me, I'll give you more than 50%, you know, for the other two brothers that are left. Because my, my wife and I said, we don't want any of the money. So it was just very funny to see them actually talk about this. And it wound up creating this, so to speak, you know, trust amongst each other. that They're going to have to be there to help each other out if God forbid anything happens to mom and I, you know, prematurely. So talking to people is very important here. And one of the other important things that I did, and I know that Donna and Minnie can appreciate this, is, we created, and I've been working with my clients for years about this, is creating an emergency book. And an emergency book is not necessarily when you die, but it could be anything, you know, living in Florida or in New York or wherever you live, there are some natural things that can happen. There could be hurricanes, there could be snowstorms, there could be wind damage, there could be floods, whatever it could be. Uh, and somebody could need to take that book really fast, whether it's on a thumb drive or whether it's all rock and chisel in a binder, whatever you think, have in a safe place. And it should have all of your passwords, copies of your documents. Think about simple things. I mean, if you've got pets and vaccines and all that st kind of stuff, it goes from the very simple things that we take for granted that you might need that when you get up and go into a list of medications for people. But it is very important that you have your estate planning documents in place your insurance, your life insurance, your disability, long-term care, whatever it is, put it in one place. Then what you need to do is organize it and put a letter and say, if you're reading this, it's either I'm disabled or I have passed away. Don't throw the party just yet because you got work to do. So you need to know that you need to talk to these people and hear the professionals that I work with. And it's Donna, it's a Mindy, it's a John, whoever it is that are gonna help your heirs or the other people that you put in charge get through things. That's what's important. As a matter of fact, you know, this year has been really tough. Mindy fought through many dates in trying to get married. And I'd like her to tell the story of the highs and lows of this year for her. And thank God she's smiling right now. So can you tell your story if you don't mind sharing, Mindy? Sure, thanks, John. And just a quick caveat, you'll find that we're answering these questions that a lot that a lot of people are asking and um, about taxes and estate planning, but we always bring it back to planning. I mean, every everything that we're talking about today, you can plan for. There's a strategy, um, so that's why we're we're bringing it back to that. But you know, John's John's mentioning uh, my multiple dates. I actually was planned to get married on April 4th of this year and had to um, what I thought cancel, postpone, whatever emotions I was feeling at the time. Three weeks before. Um, our big day and after a year and a half of an engagement and uh, now eight years in a relationship. So we're like ready to get married. And um, so this year, certainly a struggle. You know, we ended up getting married um, and accommodating to the circumstances that we're in right now. We had a backyard wedding with our parents. Um, we ended up adopting, um, rescuing a puppy this summer. So she was there. Um, so silver linings <laughs> across the board, but it really puts things into perspective. And it, it got me and my now wife talking about estate planning. Um, what do we want to do? What are our documents look like? Who gets our dog? What happens? So, you know, there's important discussions that we now need to have. Um, and also, you know, I'm having these with my parents too. I, it, 
True story. I text my parents in a group chat every three months or so to say, have you had your estate planning meeting yet? Because my dad owns um, a business. He has a couple partnerships as well. Um, my mom doesn't know much about that. And there's no documents in place. And so, um, you know, like John said, this this pandemic really um, puts things into perspective, shows you how fragile life is, and and again, the importance of planning. Um, so I'm going to pass it back to John to, to continue that discussion. Thanks for letting me share my story here. My story here. Thanks, Mindy. I appreciate that. Uh, I had a number of phone calls when she was going through the good times are bad. So, you know, my I, I, I understand how hard it can be. As a matter of fact, my son also got married this year and he did the same exact thing. At the end, uh, they finally did get married after changing the date three times. And they actually gave the two mothers, you know, of the bride and my wife, uh, uh, a coolie that basically had three dates and it said, took three times to get this right. So we kind of using this as, you know, there could be a lot worse things. And we're very all blessed here that we're in a situation where we only have our health. That's what's most important. Getting back to estate planning though, it's not all about when you die or taxes. And that's what I think Donna is very good at. You have to go back to your estate plan to update things because it's, because anything can happen at any time. And there are you know, people that come into your life and leave your life that maybe you were gonna count on that maybe you can't anymore. Maybe they passed away, maybe they moved. Maybe you've fallen out of uh, you know friendship or relationship with them. So, Don, I'm going to pass this back to the same question back to you. What opportunities have you seen and what people should be considering, if anything, before the end of this year or every year for that matter? Seeing a lot, really a lot of people are concerned, and I, I also do recommend that they put all of their important documents in, in one place in their financial stuff. So usually it's a metal box in the, in, or, or a safe in their houses. There's a lot of different things. Um, so as far as the things that I sometimes, what I'm seeing a lot of right now, people want to give, all right? They want to give their kids assets. So they have to, so then we have to look at, um, you know, what, if anything, is that going to be taxable or how does that work out? You know, again, looking at capital gains kind of issues. So sometimes cash is king and there is no capital gains issue when you give cash. So there still is a federal gift tax exclusion amount. And that amount is $15,000 per person per year. So some people say, oh, they know about this 15,000. Is that all I can give my children or anybody? And the answer is no, you can give more than that. Remember, we can give away over $11 million during our lifetime um, federally. Uh, again, if you do it now before they change the tax laws, they can't penalize you. Um, and also during, you know, so basically when you do give more than the 15,000 per person per year, that's 30,000 from a married couple, um, then you can do what's called a gift tax return. And then you can give larger amounts. Uh, under the CARES Act, we also did see that you can actually give more money um, up to the your full adjusted gross income out as a, as a, if you itemize, this is if you itemize, you can give that amount of money, which could be quite substantial to charity to a 501c3. Um, I also see something that, you know, that people have forgotten a little bit about is the SECURE Act. The SECURE Act um, is something that came about in the beginning of January. Uh, this was passed by, you know, the Trump administration. And basically, this is all about your IRAs, your 401ks, and they eliminated uh, the stretch IRA. What does that mean? That means usually what, and you may have already benefited some of you from this, where say your parents passed away and their IRA rolled over to you. And you get to have that for the rest of your lifetime and use it as you wish. Well, uh, of course, every time you get a 401k or 403b or IRA distribution, you got to pay the taxes on it. So right now, what this new SECURE Act um, actually does is it says that you can only uh, stretch it for 10 years, all right, unless it's going to a spouse. There's certain individuals that it might still be able to roll it to and be able to have this stretch. But now, you know, it's not going to be allowed further you know, going forward. Um, so that's a big thing. So some people are saying to themselves that, um, you know, that they, they want to think about that when they're making their plan. Because I see people sometimes come in here with huge IRAs and 401ks. And so now you have to kind of think about it. 
I think that hopefully, I think uh, Mindy's going to tell us a little bit more about charitable giving, but the charitable giving can be helpful for dealing with taxes. Because when you give assets to charities, then chances are you're not, or under the tax laws as they are now, that helps to bring down the, the amount of your estate. And also the thing about the SECURE Act is now giving you an opportunity, if you are continuing to work, to continue to contribute to this IRA or 401k. And the other thing that it does is that it allows us to now not take the required minimum distribution until the age of 72. It is currently 70 and a half. So these are different things that can be, um, you know, be be done now. Uh, that you know, things to consider while you're, you know, doing your planning. Uh, you know, and of course, again, I think I'm going to pass it to Mindy to talk a little bit more about charitable giving. Uh, just so that you also understand, in a will, very often I put a provision called the Santa Claus. The Santa Claus says that if my estate is going to be over the tax limits, you know, that are for the estate taxes, then I want that money to go to charity, to bring me back down to the limits so I, I don't have to pay taxes. Because, again, my best thing on any given day is to avoid paying taxes for any of my estate. And then again, if you have substantial assets, then you really need to do some extensive planning. But there's always a way to uh, plan that you can really maximize, you know, giving to your families and charities that you you really like. So I'm going to hand it over to you. I know we're kind of running low on time here, Min Mindy. So if you want to take yeah, over. Yeah, Donna, I'm glad yeah. you brought that up. Obviously, what I do for the university, Director of Gift Planning. So um, we encourage, you know, our alumni to think about establishing their legacy uh, and what you mentioned today, there's a lot of uh, planning opportunities uh, when it comes to charitable giving. So I think Mindy, you're going to uh, to share with the group on what those opportunities will be. Yeah, thank you both. Thank you. Um, so I know we're, we're at two o'clock, so some of you may have to go. Um, but we'll, we wanted to touch on this and we want to get to a question and answer section. So we will stay a little longer um, to answer any additional questions you have. Um, before I go into what I had prepared to talk about, there was a question that came through a little earlier um, as a follow up to when I mentioned um, the $300 deduct above the line deduction. The question was, can you donate clothing cash um, and still have an above? closing or cash and still have an above the line deduction. Um, so just to clarify that above the line deduction is only for cash donations up to $300. If you donate anything else or you donate more than $300 in cash, it's then subject to the itemized deduction rules. Um, so that, and again, that $300 is only for 2020. Um, they have not extended that beyond 2020 at this point. Um, so, you know, just thinking about charitable giving, um, Donna brings up a great point with the loss of the stretch IRA provision um, for most people who are on spouses that will be inheriting assets. Um, so, you know, giving charitable giving becomes more important. If you're already charitably inclined, there's ways that you can um, be more tax efficient in in doing this. So most people um, think to give cash, they write a check, they go online, click the button and donate. Um, and giving cash is great, um, but you can take advantage of greater tax benefits by and even donate more by looking at other creative ways to do that. So if you have an appreciated security, like I mentioned earlier, um, for instance, you can actually give that directly to a 501c3 nonprofit organization. You can itemize the market value of that amount you've given and you, inv you avoid paying the capital gains that are embedded inside of that position. Um, you do this by filling out a transfer form, um, get information from the charity. Um, they have an account that they receive it in, um, and they don't pay taxes on the sale of that um, security. There's another way you can do that um, by using a donor advised fund. So, um, you know, it's it's interesting. We, we, we attended um, our company attended a presentation by Fidelity Charitable. Um, there's other companies. Um, Charles Schwab has a donor advised fund. Fidelity is a donor advised fund. TD Ameritrade. Um, so there's many options out there. But it was interesting to hear from Fidelity saying that their actually donations and grants from their accounts have skyrocketed. So I'm hearing from nonprofits directly that maybe donations are a little lower this year given COVID, but then the donor advised fund um, donations are higher. And why is that? 
Um, when you gift into this, this fund or account, you receive an immediate tax deduction, but it's in an account. It's not given to the charity yet. You then grant it to the charity later. So what we've done with some of our clients, John and I, is um, we'll look at clients who have a high income year, for example, and they're charitable, again, charitably inclined already, and they take five years worth of their normal donations and move it into this donor advised fund to take advantage of the donation this year, itemize it as a deduction, and now they have this bucket of money already earmarked for giving. So in that, in those accounts, you can invest um, to have it grow, you can keep it in cash, um, and you can grant throughout the year or whenever. Um, and so, you know, I really think that that's one of the reasons that these donor advised funds are seeing their donations skyrocketed when you plan ahead and you've already said, okay, I'm carving off this piece of my savings and maybe I'm contributing it to it on a regular basis. I can now give easily this year, especially in a year like this where maybe you have your own concerns about cash flow and you're worried about your income, you're worried about your expenses. Um, so again, there's ways to plan. I talked about it earlier. It's all about the planning um, ahead of time and seeing what you can do um, to maximize. Now, there's other ways to give that um, are tax efficient. So if you are age 70 years or older, um, regardless of uh, the change, the new required minimum distribution age is 72. Um, but this applies to people who are 70 years or older. You can make what's called a qualified charitable distribution, or in short, we call it a QCD. The IRS allows you to make direct distributions from your IRA to a qualified 501c3 and pay no taxes on that amount up to $100,000. So that's a dollar for dollar um, deduction, where I just talked about that $300 above the line deduction, that's a dollar for dollar deduction. This is the same, it's not subject to itemized taxes, you can give directly um, out of your IRA. So we do see um, for clients who do not spend their full required minimum distribution, um, or they want to help even more in particular this year, um, they're making these distributions from their IRAs or their retirement plans. You know, giving to charities ties back to tax planning, donation strategies, and even um, estate taxes. If you open, let me go back to that donor advised fund. If you open a donor advised fund, you can list it as your beneficiary. Um, it can be a direct beneficiary of your accounts. Um, the portion of your account that you have designated to that goes directly into the account um, upon your passing. You pre-select charities um, in advance to receive the money, or you select someone um, to be a successor and give directly from that account. Um, this might be a good strategy um, because of that loss of the stretch IRA. If you have money that's in an IRA or retirement account and you have money that is taxable or say just in a normal brokerage account, maybe you leave that brokerage account to your children because they can inherit that. And then on the IRA side, you leave a portion or all of it to a charity um, for tax purposes. That might be a better strategy strategy. Um, so I encourage you to talk with your financial advisor, your accountant, your state attorney, um, and see what the best way is to use um, charitable giving throughout the year and also within your estate plan. And then I know we're going to be coming back to some questions. So um, let me just pass it quickly back to John real quick, um, and then we can go into to the question and answer section of the meeting. Of the meeting. Hi, Mindy. That, that was a great summary. And these are the things that we're doing all the time. And you should have somebody looking at those things if you're not, you know, up to date on these kind of things. And I, I got to tell you, you know, we have to stay on top of this. We have to read these tax laws. It's an ongoing exercise. It ne you know, we're never bored. And this is why we actually have these kind of positions and this kind of livelihood. So my recommendation overall is this. Control what you can do now. You can get second opinions from your professionals, people like Donna who do this day in and day out. Everybody gets a customized answer because their facts and circumstances are so unique to them, whether it's their income, whether it's their savings, whether it's their health, whether they're married, whether they're single, you know, whether they have children, what their charitable intentions are. These things with taxes being weaven through all of this uh, is the reason that we go through all these machinations uh, to find out what's in your best interest, because this is all about you. 
It's not about the the professionals. They're, we're here to guide you and to try to make the bat, come to the best conclusions with the, the most recent facts and information that's available. So get your second opinions from your CPAs, your estate planning attorneys, your wealth advisors, and hopefully C, CFPs in most cases, because they have the training to do these kind of things. On your investments, focus on the things you can control there. Make sure that you control lower fees and costs and taxes by just the design of the portfolios where like bonds should go into retirement accounts for the most part and stocks should be more into brokerage accounts or, or Roths. Ignorance is not bliss uh, because it can really hurt you. Be proactive and reach out. I appreciate the time that we have all three of us working together to prepare for this and for St. John's. This is a great time. There's a lot of need. Kids are still trying to get back to schools and things like that. So if you ever thinking about donations with the donor advice fund, do consider the R our alma mater here. And on this new administration, don't be fearful of what's coming. Be get get knowledge. Knowledge will take away your fears and your concerns because then you know how to address these things. And if you have the right professionals, they'll guide you so you don't make mistakes. The biggest problem with planning is that people don't talk, they don't communicate amongst each other, including the professionals. We, go, we are very proactive, the three of us on this phone call, to talk with each other so that there's no gaps in the planning. So make sure that you do that. And don't be irrational. Don't let the media drive your decisions that you have to take action to do everything. Sometimes the best action is to be, to be kind of proactively passive. That means watch and see and then make decisions. Thank you, Susan. We appreciate it. I'm glad to take all the questions you have for all of us. So there is a question. Um, thanks, John. And um, a question in here. Susan, do you want me to read it? And I think sure. Donna can answer it. Or did you want us to say? No, you can go ahead. ahead. You can. Yeah, you can read and then I'll, I'll just uh, close at the end after questions. Thanks. Mindy. Okay, great. Um, Donna, I think this is going to be a better question for you to answer. Um, so the question is, someone should talk, can someone talk about um, New York City Community Medicaid um, that will be changing um, in April of next year um, with a three year look back um, and discuss maybe moving assets out of your name? Okay, as of October 1st of this year, um, actually because of the, the budget plan that was passed by the Senate during the COVID, uh, this is the New York State budget plan. Um, they have now required that if you need to get home care, which is considered to be community Medicaid, then you, you can, you can, they're going to look back on any transfers of assets that you make in order to qualify for Medicaid. So they have now, this was usually before this law came into effect, it was a 1 month look back, meaning I can transfer assets this month. I can qualify next month. Um, of course, it takes longer than that to get community Medicaid. Now it's going to be a 30 month look back. So that's two and a half years. So any transfers that we were very busy in September because of course everybody waits till the last minute. Um, we did many transfers of assets into trusts, usually an irrevocable trust, in order to qualify someone so that they can start to protect assets in you know in with the thought that maybe somewhere down the line they may need community Medicaid. Most of the time we're as the elder law attorney, of course, everybody, you know, we want to keep people home. All right. Nobody wants to go to the nursing home, especially when you hear the things that have been going on. Um, so, of course, the home is very often the safest place to be and you get the best care. You get one on one care. So this is a big, extremely huge change that in the law. Um, technically, uh, right now, they're trying to figure out how are they going to implement this law in New York State? Um, that means that any transfers of access, they right now we have, a, I don't know if you want to call it a loophole, but we have an opportunity. Um, any transfers of assets right now, which is the law took place October 1st. If it happens now and you apply for Medicaid before January 1st for community Medicaid, then they will not look back and penalize you for that transfer. It is not clear, and I let me stress, it is not clear exactly what's going to happen after January 1st. They're saying they're not going to implement the actual, or they're not law until April 1st, but they're not making it very clear at this time what will happen if you transfer assets after April, after January 1st through April 1st. This is, uh, right now, it's up in the air of exactly how that's going to be treated. So right now, if you really need community Medicaid, that means you have to have at least three activities 
of daily living that you cannot perform. Activities of daily living are things such as um, dressing yourself, feeding yourself, um, unstable walking. You can't even get to the bathroom on your own. It's called transferring, going to the bathroom on your own, showering. So you also, they have increased the amount of, uh, of activities of daily living that you need to have in order to be able to qualify for community Medicaid. So there's a lot of changes. Uh, there's no longer going to be the household um, cleaning type of, uh, so there used to be one where they would give you an aid to help you do some cleaning and to do some chores, like going to the store for you, no longer. That is no longer going to be something that's allowed. Uh, they're not going to be promoting uh, where you can have a family member, it's called uh, CPAP, right? Where you have a, com a family member be the one who starts to help you and they get paid through the Medicaid program. This program still exists, but they're not going to make it known to you, okay? So these are things that it was required under the old law that you had to get notice when you wanted to get community Medicaid that a family member could help you. That's changed now. So there's going to be many changes. The opportunities right now, if you need Medicaid before January 1st, Try to use this loophole. It's a little unclear what's going to happen, you know, going forward. So I hope that answers the question. There was um, a comment. Maybe you want to expand on it or comment on it. Um, the same person who asked the question says they will go back to October 1st, 2020 and take the transfer out April 23rd. That's not, not sure that no, that's not clear. So basically, if you made the transfer before October 1st, then they can't look back at it at this point, okay? Because community Medicaid under the old law was a one month look back, all right? So our month is already over. We're already into November, okay? So that was October 1st. Basically what the law is going to be saying is that if I um, need to get Medicaid, uh, after this community Medicaid, and I need to transfer assets in order to get down to the Medicaid levels. The Medicaid level for an individual who is seeking to get on Medicaid is $15,750 in assets. That's all they can have to their name. Okay. A house uh, is not necessarily going to be something that if for community Medicaid, it's an exempt resource, meaning that th you can have a house and still qualify. I usually transfer that house because I don't want them to ever put a lien against this house. But on, on as far as the look back period, what that means is that if I made a transfer of assets in order to get down to that $15,000 limit, then I'm going to not be able to get Medicaid, okay? So usually we have the a rule of halves kind of uh, method in order to deal with this. So usually I gift out half the assets that I need to to qualify, and then I loan the other half to pay for the penalty period. So, I mean, I don't know how much time you have, but I'll give you just a quick example. If I give away $100,000, then Medicaid has a number that I have to um, divide into that to figure out what my penalty is. I'm gonna just say it's 10,000 to make life easier. 100,000 divided by 10,000 equals 10. That means that for the first 10 months that I need to be getting help, I have to pay for it. That's my penalty. So. If I only gave out 50,000, right, then I only have a five month penalty. I loan the other 50,000 so that I can pay during the five month penalty period. All right, so that's just to give you. So this is now going to be, this is what's been in existence for many years as far as a, a legal planning tool for nursing home Medicaid. Because nursing home Medicaid has a five year look back period. All right, so now they, this is brand new that they're going to now have this look back period for home care. And it's going to be the same method that you would use in order to qualify. And when I talk about this 15,750, that does not include when you can have also on top of that IRAs, 401ks, 403bs. Retirement assets are not considered to be part of the 15,750. So what that means is those are all exempt assets. However, they will come after the required minimum distributions. So any gifting, you know, uh, right now, depending on your health, your age, you know, you, it's a risk analysis, just like any type of, uh, you know, planning is. It's a risk analysis on, you know, what, what is it you're willing to do and, you know, how, how best, what's, what fits your needs, right? What fits your needs? So 
it is very uh, personal and specific to the person. Great. So I'm just going to, there's two more questions here. Um, I'll answer one and then maybe John, um, I don't know if you'll have the answer. We, I had mentioned that we might need to follow up on it, but the first question is, um, which withdrawal strategy applies to charitable giving from regular income annuity to avoid taxes? So I'll go ahead and answer that. Um, I think you're referring to um, a regular income. And if you say regular income annuity, uh, maybe it's like a pension where you're receiving a stream of income that's guaranteed for life. Um, this would not be considered an IRA um, where you have a minimum required, a required minimum distribution um, that you'd be withdrawing from. So that qualified um, charitable distribution applies only to retirement accounts where you are subject to that required minimum distribution. It's a way the IRS allows you to avoid taxes if you don't need your required distribution. A lot of people are using it in different, more creative ways now, um, but that's sort of the history behind it. If you do have re a regular income annuity, which I see here, you, you say, yes, that is, um, you would you would follow the same standard um, strategies that you would use for anyone with um, trying to reduce income. So we mentioned that $300. I know it's not you know a large amount, a great um, deduction, but it is a deduction for $300 above the line. Um, you may consider using um, the donor advised fund for a of your income, maybe you accumulate there and then grant out. Um, but unfortunately, you don't have the same benefit um, as a qualified for that qualified charitable deduction where or distribution where you would avoid taxes altogether. Um, so you would need to talk with your accountant, um, talk with your financial advisor about ways that you can reduce your income um, more creatively. So with that, um, Sorry, I'm just reading here. There's a follow up comment on it. Okay, this might need to be taken offline, um, maybe a little bit more complicated annuities. Um, there are many different varieties of annuities and ways that you can do that. Um, so if so, I'll send you um, our contact information. We can follow up with you on that. Um, so let me move to another question, um, which I also said maybe we need to follow up on. Um, but given that we don't have any other questions, see if maybe John, you could answer this. Um, some people have um, may have timeshares, so this particular person does. Um, if on your tax return, is there a place where you can, um, you know, add or or receive some sort of deduction for an annual maintenance fee on a timeshare? Um, this person's mentioning that theirs is increased for 2020. Um, they've never added it to their tax return for federal or New York state in the past, um, but was wondering if there's an opportunity there. Opportunity there. No, uh, maintenance maintenance is no different than somebody having in a condo or a town home. Uh, common area maintenance is the same kind of thing. Uh, real estate taxes could possibly do it. That's limited uh, right now with the federal government anyway, uh, uh, and even state on what they call the sole provision, which means that it's limited to $10,000 a year with your other forms of real estate taxes and other taxes if you're working like uh, income taxes for the states. So uh, as, as far as I know, there is no tax deduction for any kind of uh, maintenance fee related to timeshare. Okay, great. Um, okay, great. So it doesn't look like there's any other questions. Give it a second, see if anyone wants to type it in the box. Okay, we're all set. Pass back to Susan. Yeah. Okay, Looks thanks, like Mindy. I want to thank John, Mindy, and Donna so much for sharing your expertise. Not sure if anyone can see me as this call <laughs> went on. I feel like my apartment is getting darker and darker. I don't know what's going on outside, probably storm coming on. But I want to thank everyone for your patience. Sorry with some of the little technical glitches that we had in the beginning. But it's certainly, you know, there's lots of opportunities. I think, John, you, um, relate my anxiety because I have to say, uh, and I don't know if the viewers watching feel the same way, you know, with the pandemic and, you know, hearing all the news about the vaccine and the election and all of that, it does raise your anxiety level. And then you're wondering in terms of your portfolio, 
you know, what, what do you need to do? And certainly today I have to say it, my anxiety level has come down. Thank you to all of you. Uh, and I'm so glad I know all of you because I will be calling you for help because there is no way you can know all of all of it. You know, there's just there's really a lot. And uh, and that's why it's really great to turn to your advisors for assistance. Anyone who comes to me who wants to establish a gift uh, and to donate at St. John's University, I always encourage them uh, before we move forward that they turn to their advisors because uh, there is so much uh, that needs you, you need to know. And sometimes if you don't know something, it, it may cost you. So this really was very, very helpful. I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us today and also uh, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, blessings to you and your family. I hope everyone stays healthy. We have, believe it or not, possibly one more power hour that will take place in December. And then for the end of the year, we'll be com you know, complete with all our power hours since we started in March. And then we'll start for the new year. But thank you. And we're getting so many positive messages. I don't know if the panelists can see. Everyone seem, uh, seems to enjoy the conversation. And that makes me really happy. That's what we're here for. That's the purpose of the Power Hour, to stay connected. Uh, and again, happy Thanksgiving to all. And thank you again to the panelists. Have a great day. Thank you all.